welcome to episode 39 of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I'm your host, Kent Rourke, and I welcome everybody to the show. Uh, we have another special show tonight. Uh, no guests tonight, but we're going to talk about a Minnesota POA pioneer pretty much, and uh, a bunch of awards are named after this gentleman, and rightfully so, and that's Leonard Lewis. So we're going to get into his uh, experience in POAs and then uh, his untimely death when he was in his 60s, unfortunately. So, you know, but it's not going to be a sad story. It's going to be remembering all the, the great times Leonard had as a dad and a grandpa and a showman and also as a breeder. He left his mark on the POA breed as a breeder uh, as well. So and he was a huge promoter and just a you know a champion for POAs he helped a lot of people if it was borrowing them a hoof pick or a halter or giving them a horse for their kid to ride I mean that that wasn't unusual as well so uh, hopefully everybody's having a good spring I know we're starting to get into the babies are pretty much coming every day now I see on Facebook and breeding seasons in full swing I think some shows are already starting so hopefully everybody has time to come and enjoy uh, this podcast uh, but uh, I'm just kind of buying time here for some people to get on board. We're going to have a fairly long show tonight, probably about 170 pictures. Uh, the Lewis has got into POAs in the, about the mid-60s. And, of course, then his, their three children rode POAs and then two grandchildren also. So uh, we have a lot to talk about. Some things you might not realize about some of the POAs they bred and owned. And some might be old hat and you just uh, are going to reminisce and like the photos. So, um we're going to start here. So, of course, the Leonard Lewis Memorial Futurity. A lot of people know that Futurity. Uh, it started in 2003, uh, not long after Leonard passed away. There's also some other memorials. The Minnesota Club uh, does some things because uh, Leonard and Joan were such a big part of the Minnesota Club. Uh, they started in Noka, Minnesota, on their uh, Leonard Lewis place, they called it. I believe it was about six acres. Uh, the town kind of grew around them a little bit, uh, but they were there, I believe. Joan uh, was there up to just a year or so ago. So, uh, But anyway, this is, we're going to talk about some of these winners later on. There was 16 winners of the Leonard Lewis Memorial Futurity. It was uh, a youth Futurity. I believe it ended in 2018. I think I have photos of six of them uh, that won. And so that's going to be fun to look at some of those photos at the end of the show. We'll kind of reminisce about that. So, you know, Leonard, if you knew him, he was a character. You know, he didn't get along with everybody. Not everybody does. Sometimes he ha you'll see in some of these wind photos, he had a smirk on his face a lot of times. He ver didn't grin a lot of times in pictures. Sometimes he looked pretty mean in pictures. Uh, but he was a man that became known as Grandpa Leonard, and he gave a lot of advice to people, kids. He was a... Uh, like I put on Facebook, he was known as a gate man, he was known as a POA dad, a grandpa, an inspector. Him and Joan drove all over the state of Minnesota inspecting POAs when a lot of other people uh, wasn't even, you know, they weren't in it or there was no inspectors. So they went from the 218 area code all the way down to 507 in the south. Of course, they were just near the Twin Cities and Anoka. So, uh, this was taken at their house, Lewis's house. That's Joan in the background with her hands on her hips talking, and that's Leonard and, of course, uh, the late Paul Passy with him, and they're carving up a, a pig. That was the traditional Minnesota Futurity and your uh, get-together. Uh, kind of they'd do the awards, I believe, and stuff and have the Futurity. It wasn't a full show. It was just a, a baby Futurity, and then later they added some, uh, I think, like derbies and, you know, two-year-old uh, riding classes. Uh, so that was a big tradition. That's why I put this picture in there. We'll show, see a picture from the magazine later, too, because there was an article about it in the magazine. So um, this is Leonard and his three kids. So this is, remember, the family pleasure uh, classes that they had way back in the day. This would have been probably in the 70s. So uh, let's see here if I got who they're mounted on, I think. Uh, yep, Leonard, thanks to Bonnie Lewis, she gave me some information, and so did her daughter Andrea. So Leonard's riding Chippewa Scout, and then that's Alan on DM's Chino Shane. That was a, a good gilding of theirs that uh, his brother Donald showed a lot, but in this picture, I believe that's Alan riding him. And then that's Bonnie on Bonnie's uh, Sundown, and then we have uh, Donald with T.A. Big Creek Brave, who they had for a long time. 
So, Tracy, you're here barely, but you're the only one here. I started to wonder if I was even on air. So uh, let me know if everybody uh, can hear me and stuff. So we're getting going. we got a great show tonight about the Leonard Lewis family. So uh, we're already getting started. And, again, this was uh, two of these were a big part of the Lewis family. Ironically, they were both gildings, DMs, Chino Shane, the white one there in the middle, and then the end one with the star and the, the snip, and that's uh, – of course, T.A. Big Creek Brave. And they were both gildings, but the Lewis family ended up having a lot of show mares that became uh, famous and supreme champions, and then that's what they started their breeding program with later on after their kids aged out. So I'd never seen this picture before, so thank you to Bonnie for sharing this with me. I'm not sure if it was ever published or in the magazine, uh, but it's a great picture. So. So one thing about the Lewis's kids that were kind of cool, especially back in the day, all three of them won a high point saddle. Uh, as you see here, Bonnie won in 1969 at the Waterloo, Iowa International, Donald in 71 at the Hutchison, Kansas uh, International Show, and then Alan uh, in 74. I believe Alan's the oldest, but he won in 74 in uh, Sedalia, Missouri when it was there. So all three of their their kids ended up being uh, high point riders and they all uh, supreme POAs, I believe. They had, a, like I say, a lot of great mares. So um, here's the kids again. There's Donald on the right, Alan's on the left, and Bonnie's in the middle. And that's a stallion they had for a little while, High Vasiri uh, Hawks Big Creek. Uh, they didn't have him later on when they were breeding POAs, but they had him a little bit when uh, the kids were showing. So here's the gilding again, DM's Chino Shane. I believe he won. That's in Waterloo. He Leonard, that's young Leonard Lewis right there for the people that know him as Grandpa Leonard and never knew him in the 80s or in the 70s. This was in the probably early, early 70s and uh, with one of their uh, kids' gildings. And again, that's Chino Shane. Cool picture there. And there is Chino Shane with, I believe, Donald. Donald's the one that showed him, I think, the most. Uh, hopefully, if... Uh, the Lewises are watching Andrea Schaub or uh, uh, Bonnie Lewis Schaub. She can, uh, they can help me out with some of this stuff. But I, these I know pretty much because this is in my wheelhouse. So, uh, and this is T.A. Big Creek Brave, a little gilding. Um, this is Leonard again, as a young man showing him there. Young father showing his uh, kids POA as in halter. And here's when Lewis has sold T.A.'s Big Creek Brave. That's Bonnie there. And uh, he eventually went to uh, the Phillips had him for a while. I know Brad Phillips rode him in Ohio uh, after Lewis has had him. I don't think he went directly from this sale. But um, here's another gilding they had. This is Tough Gambler. He was uh, East Acres Double Tough Gilding, born in the 70s. You can kind of tell that color there. Here's HH Cherokee Crazy Alice. Of course, a lot of people know this one. Uh, the Wrights had her in the sale there from New York. The Lewis's purchased her. That's quite a bit of money in the 70s for 2550. dollars uh, I believe she went on to be a supreme champion, and we're going to see one of her daughters later in this episode and one of her grandsons that uh, made a mark on POAs, and most of you will recognize Here's Minnesota's first Supreme Champion, Cayuga's Frosty Patches. Of course, she came from the Lalans, but Alan Lewis and her were a famous team in games, and uh, they became, like it says there, first Supreme Champion. I like this ad because if you see on the bottom, registered POAs and exotic chickens, and then it says standing at stud, King Pluckett, private treaty. That's uh, Leonard Lewis's sense of humor, of course. So, uh, And you can see there they said the Lewis's later, they'd say Leonard Lewis Place. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, they'd call it that. And then, of course, they list all three kids. So this mare would be one of the mares that they supremed and then ended up using as a brood mare when they decided to breed. In 1979, they decided to breed a couple of their mares, and this was one of the first ones. And, uh, again, this is Cayuga's Frosty Patches. She was a quarter horse and then, I think, grade to a grade pony. Uh, Appaloosa Pony, but she was a speed demon and a supreme champion. Uh, she actually passed away on our place uh, when she was in her mid to late 30s because they'd let us borrow her for a couple years for uh, my nieces to ride, uh, my dad's granddaughters. So, And we actually held her to a few shows in Minnesota for uh, lead line. 
here's Allen again in Colorado. It's a famous picture with him and Cougar's frosty patches. She wasn't very tall. She was under 50, so they outgrew her pretty fast, but they retained her for a broodmare. So, again, once the kids aged out, they, had, they all had great POA careers, and the Lewises had been in POAs for, you know, probably close to 15 years when their kids aged out, and they were wondering what to do. They loved the POAs so much that they decided to stay in POAs. Well, how did they stay in POAs? They decided to become breeders. They owned six, I believe it was about six acres in uh, Anoka, and uh, so they bred a couple of their mares, and like I say, Frosty Patches was one of them. And when they bred Cougar's Frosty Patches to Gold Prince, out came Mr. Goldbar. He was their first full. Actually, Alan Lewis is down. A. Lewis is down as the registered breeder, but it's the Lewis family. Everybody would give, give credit to Leonard Lewis. You know, it's Leonard and Joan and the whole family. But in the stud books, it's A. Lewis. They showed him as a baby and a yearling, and, you know, they had a pretty good start with him. He didn't... Uh, catch the world on fire as far as winning a bunch of stuff, but he did well. It helped Leonard get his feet wet uh, showing babies. And uh, here's another picture of him here. He wasn't a bad baby. He was born in 1980. And here he is. They consigned him to the sale as a yearling, brought 1575. I don't quite remember if he went on to be a, I don't think he became a supreme champion or where he went. Maybe somebody on here will remember him, especially if he went to your area. A lot of this stuff is regional sometimes. A POA will be, you know, well-known in a region, but maybe not that well-known nationwide if they weren't in the magazine and stuff. So you see the pedigree there. Gold Prince was unknown at the time pretty much, and then Koga's Frosty Patch is the supreme champion. Uh, Paul Passy, of course, and Leonard Lewis, the, those families were pretty close in the late 70s and early 80s. The Passys were the first people to breed the gold prints, and then Lewis has followed. And here's a much better picture of him, of Mr. Goldbar. Colored picture. So, again, he was their first baby, born in, uh, I think, like April 5th or something like that, 1980. And then another one of their little supreme champion mares that they had and decided to breed was this mare right here, and this is Tough Sample. Tough Sample became a supreme champion, and years later she'd become an international champion small mare uh, after she had foals even. So we'll see that picture in a bit. Uh, but Tough Sample's biggest claim to fame, besides being a supreme champion, is she's the mother to Tough Plot it. And the Lewis family is the breeders of Tough Plot. It technically, it's the first one Leonard Lewis was ever the breeder of. He was born uh, on, I believe, April 9th, like four days after the first colt we just seen, Mr. Goldbug, uh, or Mr. Goldbar, I mean. So, um, and the Lewises had sent a tough sample out to the Munger family in South Dakota, and they were riding her. So the, he fold, she fold out there, and uh, Lewis's was going to name this colt, as the story goes. Tough Goldbug, T-U-F-F, Goldbug. They even had a name picked out. And as Leonard said, you know, if they would have got him back and stuff, he probably would have become a gilding, maybe a supreme champion gilding or something. But instead of that, fate would have it. Horseman and POA breeder Gene Carr from Heyday, South Dakota, as seen in this picture, he went to Munger's and seen the few spot colt. Gene's the person credited with naming the few spotted, as he called it, few spotted leopard in the early 70s. He came up with that study. So when he seen this uh, colt with double tough breeding on the bottom side, double tough was really popular in 1980. And then gold prints, which was an unknown quantity at the time, but Gene knew his pedigree as being from Money Creek Ranch in Houston, Minnesota, and uh, the Wees Camp breeding. Uh, top and bottom, the quarter horse and the Prince plot at part with Prince Fury being the sire of Gold Prince. So he knew this colt was going to be a valuable uh, prospect. So he bought half interest of him from the Mungers. So then that he just became the property of Mungers and Gene Carr. Gene Carr changed his name to Tough Plot It, and the rest is history. He became. Uh, the number one sire in the nation for a long time is uh, my list that I created in 93. He helped Gene become the number one breeder. Uh, Gene had been in POA since the early to mid 60s, uh, but when Tough Plot it came along, it changed his whole trajectory 
in a career in POA is that together they put each other in the Hall of Fame. We'll just say that. Gene did a lot of other things as well, as we know, with the color genetics and judging and all that. And he also bred some Cordorses and Appaloosas. But the combination of him and Tough Plotted was a great one for POAs. And uh, it made the Santee name as known as any name there is. Uh, I only know four photos of Tough Plotted that exist. There might be some more, but I know there's four published that I found. Uh, I might have missed one, but I doubt it. The first one is the rare one of Gene and him as a weanling. And then I believe this one's probably a late yearling or early two-year-old. And then here he is at, I believe, a stallion row. He's either three or four. This would have been taken in 83 or 84 uh, in Iowa, I believe. And then, of course... Uh, in 1986, he became the superior grand champion stay, and that's the year the height changed, and they had a large class and then a medium and then a small. So they had a grand champion, and that's the only year in history of the national show or national congress that they ac actually had a superior, but it was still just the overall grand. That's why there's four plaques there for you uh, trivia buffs instead of three because uh, so, the biggest one there, he became the superior grand. Uh, and that's when people really started taking notice of Tough Plot. It. Gene had been breeding him uh, since he was a two-year-old, and a lot of people bred to him early on. Lewis's brought Cayuga's Frosty Patches out and bred to him and got a filly in 1983. I think she was 10th in the futurity named Plotted's Princess, and then they sold her, and Doc Nemmers bred to him. I think Ruth Pecoy. A lot of people bred to him early on, and then, of course, later, uh, Gene just bred so many mares to him. And we will have a Santee episode later on it's just a tough episode to do because there's so many to get through and i don't want to hurt people's feelings and not mention hurt certain horses and stuff like that then you know it could be a two three parter so uh the santees especially baby wise one year at the futurity i think seven of the ten colts were santees so six or seven that was in 2004 even so and he'd won the futurity many many times before that so Here's the color photo of Gene winning in 1986. Of course, this was in Oklahoma City uh, with Tough Blotted. But Tough Blotted really wasn't known. It's ironic. He won grand. He basically, you know, he fitted him up a little bit, but he was a breeding horse. He wasn't fitted up like they do today, as you can see with the neck and stuff. But he was just such a nice built horse that he got it done. Uh, his son almost beat him. His son was uh, Santee. Uh, Twister was a yearling at the time. If he would have been older, he probably would have be, beat him for grand. So, And this is tough sample again. It's kind of funny, that same show that her six-year-old son was the grand champion stay, and she was the small-age mare winner. Uh, can you believe that? I don't know quite how old she was. She was probably uh, pushing 10 or so, uh, maybe not that old. She might have been born in 77. Uh, she might have been three when uh, he was born. But anyway... Her six-year-old son won grand the day she won the small age mare class. So just kind of a nugget there for you guys. Hope everyone's enjoying the show. We are talking about Leonard Lewis from Anoka, Minnesota and the Lewis family. We're in the uh, tough plot at Santee phase of the show right now. A lot of people didn't realize that Leonard Lewis bred uh, tough plot. It was the breeder of him, but he definitely was. Uh, but he was uh, fold out at the Mungers, and, of course, he was raised by Gene Carr. And uh, this is Santee Twister, and this is the same day. This is a poor photo, nothing against the photographer, but I was there. That was my first international I attended, and he was a beautiful colt. Uh, Tough Jet was a two-year-old looking really nice, and this yearling was looking really nice. And he beat Tough Jet, uh, who had been grand the year before. So he was, I believe, junior. But then he ended up getting beat by the small stallion for superior reserve. Uh, so his sire was the grand champion, and he was the junior champion at that show. And uh, he grew up to be one of my favorite Santees. I wish I had a colored picture of him. I've seen him many times out at Jeans as an aged horse. Uh, he wasn't very tall. A lot of people said he went over height. He didn't. I know he looks big in this picture with a big old wither, but he probably was about 54. He didn't even get very big. His dad was taller than him, and his mother was a quarter horse, so he did say small, but he had that horse look that Gene and the Santees got famous for. So I just really like Santee Twister. He kind of became a broodmare sire. Uh, again, he didn't set the world on 
fire as a sire, but he was such a beautiful horse. He wasn't a homozygous, and Gene had a lot of homozygous stallions, and then he had some corridor stallions that were nice that he bred to tough blooded daughters, so that kind of hurt Twister a little bit in the breeding shed. Here's another famous Santee, a son of Tough Plotted. Of course, this is one of the greatest halter gildings of all time. Won four years in a row. That's Santee Hancock. And a lot of people know him and uh, the, what's he, what he did. He also, uh, you know, was shown and won some for charities. Chantel Coulter there won with him uh, at the, I believe, in Indianapolis. It might have been in Iowa the year she won. I think it was in 89. Uh, but he's just a four-year-old in this picture. This is before he ever won Grand. This is when Colt Hurses were selling him. And, of course, he went on to win Grand four times after this picture was taken. And, uh, yeah, he is a beautiful horse, Terry. And in person, he was even even more stunning. Just a big body, too, huge. You know, he probably could have been a stallion. He was built about as good as Twister, really. So his mother was an Appaloosa, Santee mare. I used to show him, loved him, good. We got. I, I don't know who you are because it says Facebook user. I can kind of guess who you probably are, but I know there's going to be a lot of people tuning in tonight. And then this is a picture. Is, I wouldn't say it's rare because it was in Gene Carr's ad, but uh, the Kennedys advertised Santee Cody so much as an adult, and he did so many good things that a lot of times we f forget his baby picture. But this is him uh, when Kennedys bought him out of the magazine. Uh, as a baby in 1989, Santee Cody. So I'm just showing some of the tough plaudits here real quick, and then, of course, we'll get back into another mare that did great things for the Lewises. Here's Santee Lacey Star, another tough plaudit that was grand champion. That's Barb Hood in the picture there and Mark Borjon. Here's Tracy Porter, bred a quarter mare to tough plaudit, and out came PPP Stop and Stare. She was the first yearling filly ever to stand grand at the International. I think a couple have done it since, but in 1993 in Detroit, Michigan, she was the first one to do it. And she was the Tough Plotted Daughter. She was actually the first Tough Plotted Daughter to win. And then two years later, Santee Lacey Star, who was bred by Michaels from Nebraska. She uh, and owned by the Pony Farm at the time of her win. She was the second one to do it. Uh, and Tough Plot then became the first sire in POA history to have a grand champion, gilding, stallion, and mare, all three of them. So here is Piece of Cake. We've seen H.H. Cherokee Crazy Alice earlier, and this is her daughter, Piece of Cake, who it has Lewis connections on both sides because, of course, Lewis's own Cherokee Crazy Alice, then the Mungers uh, had her. And then the mongers brought her to the stay, and they fold out, tough plot it, and out came piece of cake. At this sale, legendary breeder Doc Nemers bought her, bred her to Doc's tough dude, and out came Doc's big time dude. And here's a picture of him. Of course, Doc's big time dude, I don't believe was ever shown unless it was after Nemers sold him as an age stallion. I know he wasn't shown as a baby because Doc knew he wanted to keep him as his heir apparent to Doc's tough dude. So, you know, this is just him and in breeding shape basically but he did a lot of good things sired a futurity winning colton philly in the same year and and sired quite a few high points or high uh, sellers for doc and ruth ann nemers so the next chapter of the leonard lewis's breeding career would be miss Hydeck. and now miss Hydeck was another one of those mares they bought as a young filly i believe she was a yearling or a two-year-old when they purchased her at, I think it was in 72 as a two-year-old that uh, probably Blue Earth, Minnesota. I don't think it was Rochester yet at the spring sale. There were so many POAs that ended up shaping the foundation of the Midwest and the Minnesota Club that went through that sale in Blue Earth and later Rochester, and Miss Hydeck was one of them. Uh, of course, she was a leopard at the time when they bought her. She ended up losing her spots a little bit. Uh, she just had some uh, funny color genetics. You know, she was racehorse on the top side, Dex High Card, and then an own granddaughter of Montana's Chieftain, the 30th registered POA ever, and own own son of Corhat Scottish Chieftain. So some uh, early pony breeding on the bottom and some fast quarter horse on the top is the mix you get with Miss Hydeck. And here she is with Leonard, shown in the 70s. Uh, she did pretty good at regional shows and, like I said, became a... Uh, supreme champion she never did win the international in her halter class she would later as a mare in full but 
Uh, when she was on her own, she, like I say, she did pretty good, especially state and regional wise. But again, she was a speedster. She was one of those ponies that uh, mares that they had that just could run a hole in the wind. Lewis has seemed to like that type. And then that's what they kept for their brood mares later on. Here she is. This picture is a quite a well-known picture of her here. So when they decided to cross her in 1980, they'd read a uh, tough sample and f Cuyahoga's Frosty Patches in 1979 to this day in uh, Gold Prince. Of course, Gold Prince was only four years old in 79, and he hadn't really proved himself yet as a sire, uh, but that was all about to change with Passy's breeding him, so the famous CAs that came out of that cross, and then, of course, Lewis's. So uh, Mr. Goldbar and Tough Plotted was kind of the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, and here's some more pictures of Gold Prince. The Crafts had him in southern Minnesota. I got to go to their place with Leonard in about 1984 and uh, see another young stallion they had that was similar to Gold Prince, but they'd already sold Gold Prince by then to the Rogers family. So the first foal that Miss Hydeck produced would be Bug Me. So I remember Leonard was going to name Tough Plot it, Tough Gold Bug in 80, but he became Tough Plot it. Well, his next colt in 1981, he named Bug Me, and it had become Miss Hydex first foal, and Lewis has showed him. Again, he did pretty well in Minnesota and in the regionals and stuff like that, uh, but he was kind of the appetizer of things to come for sure with Miss uh, Hydex because she was about to become one of the most famous broodmares in the history of POAs. And that all happened when this little guy was born. And, of course, that's the Mortal Gold Chips, born in 1982, pictured here at the Esses Park International Show with his full brother. That's a good picture of, good colored picture of Bug Me. So Bug Me is a yearling there, and Gold Chips is a baby. Now, Gold Chips, as good as he was as a baby, he ended up taking second at that show that day right there to Burnt Sugar who ended up uh, winning Reserve Grand as a baby, only the second weanling ever to do that. Hive Avatar had done it in 79, and then he did it in 82. And, of course, now there's been a Colt win Grand as a baby. Grand, not Reserve. That just happened, you know, a few years ago with uh, Awesome All Night. So, But at the time, uh, Burnt Sugar was an awesome baby, and he just edged Gold Chips out at the international show. But Gold Chips just kept going and winning, and... He ended up being the first select sire for charity winner, and that led to an article in the POA magazine by the great author Joan Schultz. She used to author some really good POA stories, especially ones about Minnesota, like the sleigh, the St. Paul Winter Carnival, and all the sleighs and cutters that the POA people would have there. And then she did this article. I think it was called uh, Breeding, Leading, and Feeding or something like that. And a lot of these pictures we're about to see were taken by Joan. And it was about the two Select Sire for Charity winners in 1982 because that's the first year for the Select Sire. And it was a very big deal. It was heavily advertised. It was prestigious. The winner of the Philly and the Colt class each received, I believe, about $2,700. That's 1982 money. I know when pickups were, what, fourteen grand for a pickup? Ten to fourteen grand. So, you know, that was a lot of money back then for the first POA Select Sire for Charity. And then the stallion owner also received money. So there's little bitty gold chips get, learning how to lead. This might have been one of the first times he had a halter on right there in Anoka, Minnesota. And then here he is again. This is with his mom now. This was Marin Full. This was at the 82 International. That's Miss Hydeck with Leonard Holdner. There's a colored photo of it. You know, on the POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond, we got to do everything uh, over and over to make sure we got it looking good so i cropped this photo so you could see it a little more intensely uh, see the marin full again that's her very first full and she was 12 years old when he was born because she was born in 1970 as we saw earlier and of course gold chips is an 82 model so this is the photo i cropped it from and i included this in here because i love this you see joan over on the right joan lewis uh, with a can or a coffee cup or something trying to get the ears up and it worked they both did it so uh, that's a cool photo there. 
Uh, Because I want to honor Joan in this podcast, too, because a lot of times, you know, especially back in the day, the horses were registered in the man's name and all that. But Joan did a lot of stuff in POAs, too. She was right there with Leonard the whole time. And, of course, she even became a national director. Uh, Leonard didn't do that, but Joan went and decided to be a director in the late 80s. And then, of course, she was on the Ways and Means Committee with uh, Bonnie Morris and those two ladies dedicated a lot of time to the POAC and went to Indianapolis, spent a lot of their own money to do things for the POAs over the years. So we definitely want to include uh, the entire Lewis family, but even their self, like I say, they called their place the Leonard Lewis place, and that's just how they advertised back then. So like I say, we're going to see a lot of pictures of gold chips as since he became famous, Immortal is the first colt to win the Select Sire for Charity. We have pictures of him from almost every month. You know, we had that April picture there when he was a baby, and then this is in the summer. And then here's another one getting closer to the Select Sire for Charity. There's Leonard showing him with this Perina number on the back there. And then here he is. That's, of course, Gold Chips and Leonard Lewis that October day. I'm sure it was in October back then. Uh, first select sire for charity in 1982. That's Chris Woods from Ohio with the American Dream. She was bred by uh, Kurt and Judy Phillips from Ohio. Uh, double tough daughter. And then, of course, Linda Lovely. She won the Philly class and Gold Chips won the Colt class. And I have a lot of pictures here of him. I mean, he was he's one of the most photographed POAs of all time, especially as a baby. But this is Gold Prince's owner uh, at the time of the breeding, and that's Bobby Kraft. I believe it was Ron and Bobby uh, Kraft, and that's her with Leonard. And then there's Joan with Gold Chips. Gold Chips was very high off the ground for a baby in 82, and I had a long profile. You know, he wasn't that wide as a baby. He didn't have a lot of muscle, but he was smooth, and he was balanced for a baby, and he had that long neck, and he just uh, caught the judge's eye. So you see how long he was for a 1982 baby. That's when the height limit was still 54, by the way. So, But they were pushing it, breeding Miss Hydeck, who was towards the top of the limit, to Gold Prince, who was a short app. But he was bred to be a short Appaloosa. So. And then when the limit changed in 86, it all became a, a moot point anyway. This is one of my favorite pictures of Gold Chips. And, of course, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the Leonard Lewis family. And we're in the gold chips section right now. Uh, you know, he took the world by storm, went in the select sire as a baby. Then he came back to the international in Illinois as a yearling and won it. This is him here. He won his class. Uh, he didn't go grand that year, but uh, that's just, I think that's such a balanced yearling there. And even the way his tail is uh, sculpted out like that, it just looked, the photo's a little rough because it's a shadow. That year it was a bad camera angle or bad lighting issue, and a lot of them weren't, didn't turn out as well as this one. But I'm glad, thanks to the Lewis family, that I got a colored photo of this because it looks a heck of a lot better than the one that was printed in the, cat, in the magazine for the winner. So. And there's uh, Leonard showing him. If you ever seen Leonard Lewis show, even towards then, the last couple of years that he showed POAs, he always kept a comb or something in his back pocket. And he was always he was a great showman, and he had that slender build, and he just looked good in suits and a cowboy hat, and he he could he would work with his babies and yearlings at home, and when he went to the show, they would stand. He was famous for walking away from them, and then walking back and curling up the the lead strap, you know, the leather strap in his hands as the horse just stood there, and he might flick an ear a little bit, but their legs seldom moved in a class. So, but I thought this was a good picture that they caught. Uh, Sharon Fallon's there caught him uh, reaching in his pocket because I've seen him do that in person. So here's another picture of Gold Chips as a yearling. Some of these were taken by Joan Schultz as well, I believe. Here's a color photo at the, when he sold at the sale as a yearling. So they consigned him, and like I say, he was pretty popular. I remember at the time Barkeeper was syndicated, and Leonard, like I say, he was kind of a joker sometimes, you know, and he had Gold Chip Syndicate hats made up because Gold Chips was one of the most popular things going. And uh, he proved that by selling for $5,400 to the Wall family. That broke the yearling record. Actually, I think it, was, it broke the stallion record at the time, but then a stallion at that same sale, a uh, plot its high bar, would sell for more than that. Uh, but for sure, the yearling record stood 
for a long time at 5,400. And there you see the pedigree, Miss Hydex, Supreme Champion, and Gold Prince still in Appaloosa at the time. That's before they hard shipped him. And here he is with, uh, I think, Mrs. Wall probably. Uh, they're congratulating the John Wall family from Pennsylvania purchasing him. He looks good. And, that, of course, that's the auctioneer in 83, and that's Patsy Ziegler. She was the pedigree reader at the time. And here's a little up-close picture of him. So Gold Chips won the Select Sire as a baby. He was second at the international show. Then he won the yearling uh, class as a year, of course, in 83. Was the high-selling record breaker as a yearling. And then as a two-year-old, there's a famous picture of him by Ruth Picoy as a yearling in the Des Moines. You can recognize those brick walls at Des Moines. There's a colored photo of it. A little hazy, but I like to show the colored photos. Of course, he was a Palomino. And uh, then he come back as a two-year-old with the Wall family, and he stood grand champion as a two-year-old. So, you know, that kind of helped the select sire for charity, too, because that mean, meant, you know, those babies were coming back and doing stuff. So uh, there hadn't even been a third for charity yet when he won standing in this picture right here as a two-year-old stallion. So here's another photo of him without his head turned. I think the first one's the one they used for the cover of the sales catalog. It had a green border on it that year. And then, of course, he came back in the fall with Kim Sims riding him, and he won the Western Pleasure uh, for charity. And there's John Wall in the picture, and, of course, uh, the great POA alumnus Kim Sims rode gold chips as a two-year-old. There's the color photo of it. So he could he proved that he not only was a good baby, he won grand as a two-year-old, and then he won a faturity, riding faturity at the big uh, faturity show at the sale, and that was in 84 as well, and that was in Iowa. And then here he is as an age day, and when he came back to the sale, he sold for good money again. I believe he sold for 6000 or over. And uh, that's when he, I think he might have headed to Indiana for a while. I'm a little hazy on his career, but I think he did. Uh, he kind of bounced around a little bit, gold chips. You know, his legend became bigger than he did as far, as far as a stallion, but he was ridden, and, you know, he does have a great show record and stuff like that. So here he is with Heather Smith when he was owned in Indiana. Uh, they did have a baby win in uh, 1993, uh, had a Weanlink Philly win. She was a Palomino. Uh, she ended up going to the Damons, bought her, and used her for a broodmare for a long time. So here he is again, and now here's Miss Hydex, second edition. This is Miss Goldust, and she did the exact opposite of what her brother did. In this picture here, that day she won her class, her Weanlink Philly class at the International, and then at the Fall Futurity, she was second to a double tough daughter, Doc's uh, Miss Firefly, shown by the Kozers, by Mark Kozer, owned by the Scheidecker family. So she did the exact opposite of his, was him second in the summer show, and uh, or first in the summer show, and second at the Select Sire for Charity. And here she is, Melanda Lincoln picture there. It was in Springfield, Illinois in 83. Again, you see the shadows, but she was a pretty filly. I got a lot of pictures of her, too. She was pretty growthy. She was a little bigger than Gold Chips would be. Her, of course, Miss Hydex's second baby. That figures, probably. I always like this picture of Leonard showing her. And I like that blue suit. Of course, that's 83, this picture was taken. So here's the example of Leonard. He's standing there. He's a little closer, but he's standing like a statue. She's standing like a statue. This would be at his house in Minnesota, at his place uh, during the Minnesota Futurity. And uh, Bud Campbell's the fourth one back in this picture. I believe Arnie Marker's in here and Tom Marker. I can't recognize the other two, but uh, six fillies in this picture. And she's at the head of the class there, and her ears are not up in that picture. I believe Joan Schultz took this picture, but she's standing like a rock. There's only a couple of them. Bud's got his pretty good, and the lady in third there's got hers pretty well. But uh, Lewis always had his 
baby's standing so well. I believe uh, Jan Rogers took this picture because they'd bought gold prints, of course. So this was uh, Miss Gold Dust looking down from the arena. This was in Des Moines at the Futurity. A little blurry, but it's a colored photo that she'd sent me for the Gold Prince episode, so it was worth including. And I like this. They used to do this in the magazine. They don't do this anymore, but it's so cool. You get to see how the judges placed. You know, so Miss Gold Dust had an eighth, a ninth, and a ninth. So she was right up there, you know, but then she got beat by one that had two tens. So, and then she had an eighth for, by the third judge, the first place. So you even see the point breakdown and you see some had a 10 and a zero and stuff like that. So I really like uh, statistics like this. So that's why I included it in here. Now this isn't the best picture ever taken of her, but this was the reserve picture when she took second at the Select Sire Futurity. This is the picture they used. And I think some of the other pictures showed her uh, a lot better than that. But that's the one that was in the magazine that year. So this is her when she grew up, Miss Gold Dust. Of course, she ended up a cornerstone of the Erdman family. Uh, and uh, of course, Erdman's and Lewis's became good friends. Lewis's bred to Russ T-Bars. We'll get that get to that later in this uh, episode. Uh, but this is Miss Gold Dust as a older mare, and she had uh, quite a few babies for the Erdmans, and she set a record also as a brood mare. So we'll kind of look at some of her babies real quick before we go back to High Deck's third fall. So again, this is Miss Gold Dust as an aged brood mare at Erdman's in Wisconsin, Bill Erdman's. And she kept that pretty head, you know, she had as a baby a little horsey head, but she still kept that cool looking head. And uh, there you can see it there. So she's the mother to Miss Gold Cadillac, and that's Sue Erdman, Sue Bettenhausen now, uh, showing her there. I think that was at the Futurity or at the sale, and uh, she sold pretty well. And then, of course, the Behringers, Mike and Kathy Behringer ended up with her, and she became one of their cornerstones for the Truly uh, POAs. I think she had like seven babies for them and uh, helped their stay in uh, become really famous yours truly was their stallion of course they've had other stallions but he was their hallmark stallion basically and i think he had six babies maybe seven if kathy's watching she can correct me but i got pictures of a lot of them and uh, i'm just going to run through these kind of quick because we're getting a little far out from the lewis tree now but it is connected to leonard lewis through miss gold dust so these would be grand get of miss gold dust and you of course, we'll be talking about yours truly and the Behringers. Probably this summer, we're going to do an episode about the Behringers from Illinois. Their two sons grew up in POAs, were uh, good rainers and good showers. Of course, Mike loves the, the show Halter still. And uh, these were all out of that mare. So all Trulies. I miss Gold Cadillac. There's Mike's dad. Looks just like him. I couldn't believe it when I seen that picture. There's Mike again. I know a lot of people recognize all these Trulies. And, uh, we're going to talk about these in depth again probably in June or so whenever I get together with Behringers and have uh, an episode about them. So I want to thank Kathy for sending all those pictures to me. So after she had uh, that mare that the uh, Behringers ended up with, she also produced two select sire for charity uh, Colts, Rusty Gunn and Marshall Jake. Uh, they were both by Russ T-Bars, Erdman Stallion, and that made her the first mare to have uh, full brothers or, you know, two colts that won the Select Sire for charity. And she was reserved herself, so that was a pretty cool story. And her brother was the first one ever to do it. So a lot of history there. Here's Marshall Jake as a gilding. So this is uh, Miss Gold Dust's last baby this is dusty's last hurrah hence the name and of course this is kara dembski from wisconsin thank you to uh, bob and linda and kara for watching all the time and liking all my posts and sending me pictures when it obtains their stuff and uh, she wrote this was one of her junior ponies of course she rode campbell's birdie but this was dusty's last hurrah that she rode as a junior horse so after gold prince went to iowa 
some of the Minnesota breeders decided not to follow him down there, so the Lewis family had to look for another stallion to breed Miss Hydeck to. And, you know, she'd already had the two babies that would become champions, and uh, so they were looking to keep going with that. She basically became their only broodmare for a while because they stopped breeding Cayuga's Frosty Patches, and, you know, they only ever usually bred two at a time. I don't think they ever bred more than two in one year. So it was important who they found to cross him to, so they went and bred to Doc's Built Tough, full brother to Doc's Tough Dude. He sold for $3,000 as a baby, and, uh, of course, he became a champion. He won the international as a baby, won it as a yearling. Uh, he did get taller than 54, so he didn't show for a while, but then when it became 56, again, it was a moot point because he was under 56. So, But he was a model-looking POA, again, from the Doc Nemers program by Double Tough and out of Doc's Miss Puff. Uh, his full sisters were Doc's Wipeout and Doc's Double Sweet. Of course, Doc's Double Sweet became the mother to the Crisco Kid and the grandmother to the Silver Kid. So a lot of great genetics there. So the first full from that cross of that young stallion we just seen there and Miss High Deck was Double Deck. And here's a good Ruth Pecoy picture. Uh, taken outside that brick wall again, and that's Leonard uh, standing there kind of with that smirk on his face like he gets. I seen Double Deck when she was probably three weeks old. She used to get away from Leonard once in a while, and I remember at one show Mike Canton caught her twice, and he said, if I catch her again, I own her. <laughs> and that was a kind of a funny joke at that show. She was really young then, uh, but she uh, she grew up to do something while well, she did it growing up that no other POA has done. So she won the international again, just like her half-sister the year before. And this is the picture here with her mom, Miss Hydeck, at the international show. That's Leonard with Double Deck, and that's Tom Loth uh, from Yota, Minnesota, uh, with Hydeck. And I believe they won Marin Full, but she won her class, Double Deck did, as a baby, yearling, two-year-old, and three-year-old. And she's, I'm still, I still think she's the only POA to this day to ever win her halter class the first four years of her life. So now when she was a two-year-old, they didn't have a three-year-old class. So that almost screwed it up. The three-year-olds had a show in 86 with the height change. They had a show with either the small, medium, or large, whatever they happened to measure. But then the next year, the board changed it back to a three-year-old class in 87. And she showed by herself in the three-year-olds. I mean, there was others in there, but in her own age, and she won again. So again, a baby, yearling, two-year-old, and three-year-old winning at the international show. That's quite a record. So, and this, again, this is double deck, uh, Miss Hydeck's third full, and uh, the first by Doc's Built Tough. Now, this is a picture taken at the Leonard Lewis place at the Minnesota Futurity. This was the 84 Futurity. This was in the magazine. Joan Schultz, I believe, took this picture. And, of course, that's Leonard. And then if you look on the rail there, uh, that's Jackie Guthrie in the background. You know, she was the director for the Midwest at the time, one of the two or three directors at the time. So she'd usually come over to Minnesota stuff because it was close. It was in her region. So that's her uh, right behind Leonard there. And then in the middle is, I believe, Dan Neller from up by Alexandria, and I think that's his daughter. And then on the far right, uh, like in a sweater, vest, or jacket there, that's my dad. That's uh, Pat Rourke. So this picture's kind of cool. And, you know, of course, we talked two weeks ago, last episode, about Jackie Guthrie and the impact, and now we're talking about Leonard. And then, of course, my dad's my dad. So I really like this picture. And Dan Neller in the middle, there's an arena named after him in uh, – in Alexandria, so a show arena. So kind of cool picture there. Now here's Double Deck. So uh, Leonard's uh, Slex Sire Futurity Prowess, he was first with Gold Chips, second with Gold Dust, Miss Gold Dust, and then this year in this picture, he was third with Double Deck. So he was always right in there, you know, and he'd end up being second at least three times, I know of in his career showing babies of his own. Uh, maybe even more than that, but I can prove he was reserved three times, and of course he won it the very first time. So, but this year he happened to be third with double deck. But like I say, her her claim to fame was winning the international her first four years. So here's a cool ad that I included. Uh, this is uh, Joan and Leonard's grandson Jeremy. 
Of course, Jeremy played a big part in their POA career later on. You know, he, he's what kept them going for a while. They weren't even breeding much, but they were hauling Jeremy down the road showing, and he showed a lot of great POAs. And there he is, a little bitty guy on Dee Dee, they call her double deck. She was only two years old in this picture, double deck. So that's a cool picture. I hope everybody's enjoying the show. I see Tracy's commenting and some other people commented. Hopefully we get uh, quite a few viewers. You know, we usually have 20 to 40 viewers watch it while it's live. I understand it's tough just to turn in live sometimes, but we usually end up having at least 500 views throughout the time it's on Facebook. And uh, this is the 39th episode. And I have a few of the 39th eight so far that haven't got 500 but very very few uh the first one had 3500 so we rocked it that night but we have probably about close to 10 that have over a thousand and most of them are anywhere now this year uh the nine episodes we've done this year or eight not counting this one have been around you know 800 to 900 uh, views so that's pretty cool i understand some people might view it way more than once if they want to see something or study something so uh, I appreciate everybody watching. So, again, there's Double Deck. That's when they sold her uh, as a three-year-old in 1987 at the international sale. This a little closer picture of her. And there she is in the ring. Her spots were funny. It was like you scrubbed on them a little too hard, and uh, they were starting to vanish. But they stayed on her at that age for sure. So this is Lorenda Neblock, great POAers. They were good friends of the Lewises. They were also from Illinois. Uh, you know, the Lewises ended up having close relationships with the Neblocks from Illinois, the Coraleskis from Broadhead, Wisconsin, but close to Illinois. And then, of course, the Erdmans were over close to Illinois as well, but also in Wisconsin. And uh, this is Lorenda. She rode and did well on double deck as a four-year-old. And I believe she won, she won some stuff as a four-year-old for sure. And so, again, she proved she just wasn't a halter baby or that record four years in a row. She could also ride as well. So, and then she also went on to the Spencers, uh, Double Deck did, and she had some foals for them. I believe she even had a stay, and I don't have a lot of information on that. Uh, someday when we do the Spencers episode, uh, we can talk about Double Deck a little more in detail as she got as an older mare and as a brood mare. So, in 1985, Miss Hydeck missed for the first time. I can't remember what happened. Uh, I think she had a baby and it passed away young or something like that. So, Leonard needed a baby to show, so he turned to Coraleski's and picked up KK's Goldilocks and her baby, KK's Rio Tough. Now, KK's Goldilocks, even though she has the Coraleski prefix, she's just like some others, like Tough Plot and stuff. She was bred by Leonard Lewis. She was by Gold Prince and out of Cayuga's Frosty Patches. So she'd be a full sister to the first one they raised, which was Mr. Goldbar. So, and I believe she was a Palomino with a little bit of frost. I know she had to be colored because uh, this is a classic snow cap here, but she had a little bit of white on her, but I'm pretty sure she was a Palomino. And I think she was a pretty big mare, uh, KK's Goldilocks. But when bred to Built Tough, she had this classic uh, snow cap filly. And here's a really good picture of her. And, of course, there, thank you, Leonard. And uh, that's Coraleski's thanking him. And now this filly play, placed, I think, third or so. It was a very tough show in Ohio that year in Columbus, Ohio. Ohio Miss Muffet, as I know Tracy loved that filly. And there was some other tough fillies. Dudes, uh, Chip and Dip was in there. I think she won the class. And uh, 1985 was just a tough year for for fillies uh nearly double didn't show as a baby but she was in that class and there was a lot of fillies in that age group that was just a a stellar filly year in 85 but anyway uh she ended up uh not winning the international show and she didn't win the select sire for charity but she won a lot of stuff and you see this professional photo here with gary by gary hamilton and uh just a cute filly leonard did a great job conditioning her had a lot of chrome and uh she, I think she placed third in the select sire for charity, too. I know she was in the top four. Here she is winning the Wisconsin for charity for Coraleskis. And then here she is at the sale. 
at the Futurity. Of course, she was purchased by the Rupplingers, Lee Rupplinger, she, her daughters, Amy and Becky, uh, showed in POAs. Of course, Amy's the mother to Sammy. Uh, Sam Bruns that shows uh, POAs, trains POAs. So she's a heritage trainer. She grew up uh, showing POAs just like her mother did. And uh, they had KK's Real Tough. Of course, KK's Real Tough ended up going to Tommy Tomlin. If you've seen that episode this year, I think it was my second episode of the year or first uh, when we talked to Levi and Tommy. And uh, we talked about Rio Tough a lot that night. She ended up having a lot of uh, good babies for Tommy. Kind of really was the cornerstone of his breeding program and put him on the map. She ended up having three few spots. This is a bad picture of her, but this was uh, when she won as a yearling. Uh, Leonard showed her for Rupplingers, and she, I believe, they owned her already, and she won the international. So now this is Miss Hydex's fourth baby, and this would be. A half brother to the one we just seen on the top side would be Rio Tufts' um, half brother, but he'd be Double Deck's full brother. And this was Top Deck, and he won the baby class again. So High Deck had three babies in a row, not counting the year she missed one, uh, that won the international. So uh, this was 1986. And here he is again, placed third, just like his full sister in the Select Sire Futurity. He was right in there. Uh, and those were tough classes back in the day as well. So they were some big classes and some tough classes. So this is uh, Top Deck. When they sold him, they sold him as a yearling, consigned him to the same sale. They sold uh, his full sister at Double Deck. And uh, I know he ended up going to the Myers. Larry Myers' daughter showed him. I had a picture he sent me of a headshot with Mr. McHugh and her him but i think it didn't miss the it missed the cut with not from me but the computer cut so we came close this time i had 174 pictures queued and 173 came through so that's 90 some percent pretty good this time so but this was top deck again miss high uh fourth national champion and fourth full fifth full and fourth national champion here's a little better picture of him of course he was a homozygous POA, but he was gilded. He was a gilding. Went on to do pretty good. So, this page right here in the magazine, I didn't make this up. This is an actual page taken out of the 1986 magazine. And if you're a member of the Lewis family or you're a Leonard Lewis fan, this is a very special page because there's nine POAs pictured here at the national show, all champions and halter. And Six of the nine have connections to Leonard Lewis. If you go through, look at my hand diagonal like this. So if you start at the top right, that's Tough Jet. And then go in the middle is Plotted's, uh High Bar. And then down on the bottom is the Cookie Philly, that one. Uh, chocolate Cookie uh, from York. Those three weren't connected to Lewis's. But the first Colt on the top left, that's top deck we just talked about. Then, of course, Twister's uh, son of Tough Plotted. He's bred by Gene Carr, but Tough Plotted came from Lewis. Then you go to the second page. I guess there's another one right there. He's not connected, so you have four that's not connected, that uh, stay in there. But then you have Tough Plotted. Then on the bottom of the page, you have KK's Rio Tough and Double Deck. So... I was thinking Tough Sample was in there, but she's not. That's not Tough Sample. That's the stat, the little stay in uh, Prisoner of War, I believe. So, uh, But anyway, so many of those. That show was so awesome. for It was the peak of Leonard Lewis's showing uh, career. And, you know, he did a lot of great things after that. But they'd been in POAs almost 20 years then and had been breeding POAs for six years when this show took place. And he just, they won so much that day. Um, here's the two full siblings winning Mare or uh, Produce a Dam. And now I got a funny personal story here. Uh, Leonard's not in this picture because Leonard had to fly back to Minnesota because he had something going on. So Joan stayed and the horses stayed. But uh, Leonard had to go and uh, Tom Marker, Arnie Marker's son, had to fly back too. So they flew back together. And 
my dad had a, has a friend in uh, Bristow, Oklahoma, that came down to visit us. We stopped at his place on the way down. So he gave him a ride to the airport in Oklahoma City. Teddy did. Teddy Yoakum gave Tom Marker and Leonard Lewis a ride. Well, again, Leonard, you know, he was kind of a smart aleck sometimes and stuff. Well, they go, they say their goodbyes, and they go out in the parking lot. Of course, Leonard had had a big day. It was still Halter was going on, just like last year, how the show went till 10 or midnight on Halter Day. This was, you know, they had to get going to catch the plane. So when it became afternoon, they had to leave. Well, they were out in the parking lot taking off, and Joan goes, I can't remember the exact what she said, but something like, oh, my goodness, or whatever. Leonard forgot his ticket. She had her ticket, his ticket in her hand. And my dad was, let's see, he would have been 47 at the time. He grabbed the ticket from her and took off running, and he ran a long ways. And he caught him. When he got to him, Leonard said something smart, like, you forget something? And uh, th- it was so funny. It's just a cool story because, you know, my dad goes, no, I didn't dumb whatever you did, you know. And it was, they laughed, and it was funny. So that's just a cool personal story there. But. That's why Leonard's not in these pictures. I believe that's Tom Foster, I think. I might miss a, and uh, it might be Leo, uh, Leo Hawk. I'm not sure. That looks like him. Uh, but anyway, that's in 86. These are fuzzy, grainy pictures. I know that's Kay Dugard in the middle showing uh, Rio Tough. So this was uh, Built Tough's Get a Sire. The first one was Produce the Dam for Double Deck, and I mean Miss High Deck. It was double deck and top deck. And then in the middle now, you had KK's Rio Tough, the yearling. So you had the champion weanling colt, the champion yearling filly, and the champion two-year-old filly. Well, you put those together, and, of course, they won first place. And I know for sure they did, not only because the trophy's there, but I was standing in second place with, uh, I think, uh, the both markers. I don't know if Tom was still there or not, but we showed for uh, East Acres Tough to Beat. And we had double shot and two Markadot fillies that all looked alike. They were all weanlings, and we ended up second. So there was four double tough sons that year that were in Gita Sire. Only four entries, but Built Tough won it. East Acres Tough to Beat was second. Doc's Tough Dude was third. And I think JBJ's Totally Tough was fourth, something like that. So I always remember that. Okay, so 1987, she missed having a full again. She didn't miss often, but she missed them. So then in 88... She had uh, full deck, and full deck would be another full sibling to uh, double deck and top deck. He didn't become quite as famous as a halter POA. He was a little more, as you see, stretched out, a little longer neck. This is Bonnie, uh, Leonard and Joan's daughter, of course, showing him here. Uh, that's when the you know the 19 and over started and the trainer futurities and all that. That was getting going in the late 80s and early 90s. So she used their homebred to, to ride. So this is full deck. And then I believe she had another one, I think, named Winningran. He didn't become that famous. But those first three or four babies, you know, they really put the Lewises on the map as a breeder out of Miss High Deck. And then, of course, also Tough Plot It. So, um, so in the 90s, they kind of started slowing down a little bit breeding. Miss High Deck was getting older. She was in her 20s now. So Leonard started helping uh, Erdman's condition and show some babies. I think I might have the name wrong here, but I think this was Mr. Bud Light or something like that. And then I'm not sure who this baby is. It might be a Super Sun baby by the pattern. It could be very easy. And then this little colt was born at the Erdman's. And I think that as the story goes, he was sickly or something like that. So Leonard took the the mare home, kind of like he did Rio Tough. Not that Rio Tough was sickly, but he took the mare home and showed the baby why she was still on the mother. And he took him home and started uh, caring for the colt. And, of course, this became the famous gilding Rockin' T-Bars by Russ T-Bars and out of a rock star mare. And he became a two-time grand champion gilding. Here's Tom Wamsley showing him to one of his titles. Just a beautiful horse. Uh, of course, Rusty Bars became a very famous stay, and he was bred by the Erdmans. And uh, not only did he have good stuff for Lewis's, but the Erdmans as well did very well with his foals. So here's another foal. I can't quite place this foal. Maybe somebody will know this, but I like this photo because Mrs. Erdman's in here and Sue. And then, of course, that's Joan by the main there. Leonard's showing him. Leonard's getting uh, 
a little older in his show career here. This was a couple of years uh, before his death, of course. And then that's Bonnie Lewis on the left. So that's why I included this picture. And I think that baby probably did good at the show, too. I think it's a filly of Erdman's is who this was, but I can't place who it was. So now we move on to another uh, chapter in the Lewis's breeding saga. And this was a quarter horse mare that they purchased. And they actually came out. They used to come and visit us. We'd go to Anoka once in a while, but they'd go looking, like I say, inspecting POAs over the years. And they would go, uh, they would also go looking for birds. And he had exotic animals like four horned sheep and different things like that. And they'd haul Jeremy around and go pick up these animals and he'd trade and buy and sell exotic birds so he'd get out towards litchfield and different areas in central minnesota once in a while and they'd always swing by uh, we broke bread many times together the lewis family with the rourke family and one day they happened to stop by and they mentioned they were looking for a broodmare and this was in the 90s mid 90s and our farrier just so happened had been there the day before and mentioned he'd found a short quarter horse mare. Well, the rest is history. My dad drove him over and Bonnie was with, and Bonnie actually purchased this mare for her husband to ride trail riding, I think, and they wanted to breed her too. And this is a quarter horse mare named Luz What a Chick. And she was a 1983 mare. They purchased her, I believe, in probably 95, so she was already 12. I know. Um, I remember they had her vet check. That was part of the deal because I was standing right there when Bonnie bought her. And the deal wouldn't go through if she couldn't have foals, and she passed the vet check. Well, in 96, Crash and Burn was born. So the next saga, the last saga, basically, in the Leonard Lewis uh, breeding program. And, of course, this is Crash here as a baby. All these babies look so close I could misidentify them, but they all had those two little socks in the back, or three of them did, and then those little blankets. The two colts had the little blankets, and then the two fillies uh, didn't have as much. So this mare ended up producing four foals uh, by Rusty Bars. And, of course, Crash was the first one. I don't have a good baby picture of Crash. These are cool pictures out on the, when he was just born. That looks like the day he was born. Uh, but I don't have a baby picture of him. But Leonard actually showed him at the Select Sire for Charity and was second in a very tough class. That's the year Mark Kozer had... Uh, Cowboy Brass, the big leopard, if you remember him, and he, he was a dominant colt. He was tough to get around, but Crash was really tough to get around too, and he ended up reserve, and uh, that was a big class. There was probably close to 50 in that class, uh, and that was in 96. So he was uh, reserve select sire. He would be uh, the second one of Lewis's to do that. Of course, here he is uh, as an older gilding, now, he was ridden by Jeremy, of course, rode him, the, Lewis's grandson, and then Mallory Herman, uh, Anna Hallwig rode him, and then, of course, Bonnie's daughter, Andrea, also rode him, and he won national titles with, I think, all of them. He did really well. He, he actually became Lewis's probably one of their best all-around POAs by far. Some of their early stuff was halter champions, but he became an all-around just good-looking gilding and went he would win uh, a lot. So he was one of those dependable gildings. So here he is with Peekaboo Street in the picture. And I might get these names mixed up, but again, I want to give a shout out to Jeremy, Mallory, Anna, and Andrea. So of course, uh, two of them were Lewis's grandkids that wrote him. But uh, here he is. I think this is Andrea, and I think that's Anna with, standing with him when Andrea started to ride him. This would have been in 05 at the Sioux Falls Regional, the Midwest Regional in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And he just had a look about him. I mean, that, that mare was a nice quarter mare, short quarter mare. And then uh, Rusty Bars, again, uh, put a stamp on him. He was a good sire. So he would be the first of that cross. And like I say, he was ridden by, yep, she said, yes, me and Anna. So thank you, Andrew. That's got to be Andrea that said that. I hope you're enjoying the show. I'm trying to do your family justice. So, you know, it's hard to put it together in an hour and a half or two hours, but I'm going to do my best. So um, here's Crash again. And like I say, he became just an all-around great gilding. <laughs> 
That's a pretty cool picture there. She don't look too excited. I think that's Andrea. So when she first started showing him. So the next Colt that mare had, lose what a chick, was a 1999 Colt. So, well, actually, she had a Philly in 98. She had spring front fling in 98. So she had crash and burn in 96. I don't know what happened in 97, but it wasn't a baby registered. And then in 98 was spring fling. We'll get to her in a minute. And the third one, aptly named Triple Treat. And this is Leonard and Joan. And that's a weanling there. He's a big-bodied weanling. He, uh, I remember somebody telling me, Leonard's got a baby here. Looks like a Angus calf, he goes. Well, he ended up being second. And they were saying it as a term of endearment, not knocking. I mean, he was that stout. Well, he took second again that year in the Slex Sire for charity. Uh, Triple Treat did. So just like his full brother three years earlier. So, And that's a good picture of Leonard and Joan there. And then this is one of my favorite pictures here. Of course, this is Leonard holding the yearling triple treat. And then his grandson, Jeremy, who Joan and Leonard hauled all over the country, uh, Jeremy Poitra. He's uh, their son, Alan. That's his son. And uh, Jeremy's showing crash and burn. And Leonard's showing triple treat and their full brothers. There's triple treat. And I think that's Andrea. She can correct me if I'm wrong. But see the socks again and the little star? And I don't think he roamed as much as his two of his full siblings did. But now here's another great picture. So this is three of them of the cross. So that would be Spring Fling on the left. She was the filly. She was the second one. Of course, that's Jeremy with Crash and Burn. And then... That's triple treat. So if you look in the background, look at all those socks. You can barely see the right hind sock of Crash and Burn, but it's white and half stocking anyway, half socking anyway. So there's six socks in this picture, and they're all in the back. So these are three siblings, full siblings, by Rusty Bars and Lou's What a Chick, AQHA, all bred by the Lewises, and three of the later ones they ever bred. And so you got Crash and Burn in the middle. Spring Fling, a filly on the left, and then the 1999 Colt uh, Triple Treat over on the right. So, yep, she said that's me. Andrea, do you know who that is holding Triple Treat? I apologize, I don't know who that is. And they cut out the, they'd crop the, the exhibitor with Spring Fling, so I don't know who was holding her, but uh, I want to give justice to whoever's holding Triple Treat there. So, and then this was the fourth full and her name was mirror image and i can just imagine they named her because she's a mirror image to the quarter mare no not much for socks the mare didn't have much white on her at all uh but and then she didn't have even though rusty bars is a snow cap uh this one came out solid at birth but if she was tested nowadays she'd probably uh would be okay but again her name was mirror image and she was the fourth one out of the cross she would have been born in the 2000s all right, Andrea, that's okay. So that she doesn't know that. So the last foal that Leonard Lewis was connected with, and unfortunately he didn't see her be born. He passed away before she was foaled. But that's this filly, and that's the champion mare all of a sudden. And she's out of spring fling. And then, of course, her sire is the sudden impulse, Appaloosa, son of a sudden impulse and here she is with Andrea and this filly has been showing a lot mare she was shown by a lot of different families but Andrea came back and showed her she showed crash and all of a sudden and like I say she won a lot very modern looking POA of course she has a lot of horse blood in her so Again, the significance, not only did she win a lot of wins for the Lewis family, she was also the last one, uh, technically, that Leonard was the breeder of. So, now we started the show talking about the Leonard Lewis for charity. You know, they started that memorial for charity in uh, 2003. The first winner of it was Aaron Casper. Uh, Leonard was a big fan for promoting the youth 
you know, I wouldn't say he was against adult riders or anything because his own daughter rode in the 19 and over program, Bonnie. But uh, they created this futurity for youth only. And, of course, the futurities for young, for junior horses. And uh, Aaron Casper from Decorah won the first one with uh, Tough Girl in Town. Of course, Tough Girl in Town was a Slex Sire futurity winner. She was uh, out of a JBJ's mare and by Fool and Who, a kiddo tough son. So here's a little better picture. That other one was taken from the magazine or from a newspaper. I want to thank Aaron for sending me this stuff. I know uh, she really respected Leonard and uh, she called him Grandpa Leonard. And she won the first one uh, after he passed away, the first memorial for charity. So this is the 07 winner. There was 16 winners, as we mentioned. This is Eric uh, Blumquist from Wisconsin, uh, Eva Dahl's son, and this is Rough and Tough Impulse. He won the 07 McLaren Fitcher, or I'm sorry, Lewis Fitcherity. I got that in my head because Ricky from uh, Kansas has been working on the Lewis list and the McLaren list. She's helping POAs out, trying to save their history like I do and Jeremy from Kansas and Jackie from Wisconsin and Tracy and there's a lot of others out there too that know we got to preserve history so uh, Ricky did a good job printing out these lists she still got a few holes on the McLaren but uh, thanks to the trophy we solved the Lewis mystery so of course that's Leo and Leanne in the picture they own the sire first impulse so this is the 11 winner this would be uh, of course Eric's sister uh, Christina Blumquist showing impulse is in town now she's another first impulse daughter but she's also a daughter she's out of tough girl in town the first Lewis Futurity winner the one Aaron rode so that's kind of a cool story there so I think I have pictures of about five or six of the Lewis winners I don't have all 16 unfortunately but uh, here's the 12 winner my brother's the breeder my family's the breeder this one's Sonny's first class kid kiddo tough and a quarter mare my brother had of course the crimson kid won it in 04 and i didn't even put a picture of him in there so you can't blame me for uh bragging about my own stuff because i didn't even get his win photo in here uh and of course back in 12 that was katie katie hasselbrook now uh thorland showing uh sunny's first class kid and of course katie's a heritage breeder because she grew up showing poas and she's still raising uh poas as an adult so this is in 2015. I believe this is one hot chip. Of course, he was by uh, TX's Chip and Array. And he was shown by Shannon uh, Bear from Iowa. And then this is the last winner here. And uh, this girl actually won it twice. This is Carolyn uh, Fredenberg from Indiana. And she won in 16 with Between Boyfriends, and then she won again in 2018 with The Chocolate Doctor. So, of course, The Chocolate Doctor's a grand champion. Gilding, his full sister, was a grand champion mayor. He's by Chocolatey and out of Doc's Sudden Attraction. So, Chocolatey had the last two winners, Chocolatey Chassis, and then, of course, The Chocolate Doctor. So, that's a little bit of the Lewis Fichiri. There's also uh, memorials held at the Minnesota year-end awards every year for Leonard and uh, again rightfully so uh, Joan and Leonard had to wait a little while to get in the Hall of Fame I know my dad nominated them one year and I'm not sure if they got in that year or they might have got in the next but I know my dad nominated them they were 10 years overdue when that happened uh, but they finally did both go in they wanted to go in together they deserved to go in together and they did uh, so they're both Leonard and Joan are both in the Hall of Fame Here's another great photo just taken out in Bonnie's uh, pasture, Bonnie Lewis's pasture. But uh, you have two full siblings and then one of the POAs, one of the siblings' daughter. So you got some national champions in this picture. So you have Crash and Burn. I believe he's on the right. Then his full sister, who's almost a clone to him, uh, Spring Fling. Look at the socks and the roan, the varnish marks on the knees, the face mark. I mean, they look very similar. And then, of course... That's uh, all of a sudden in the middle, and that's Spring Fling's daughter. So uh, I'd never seen this picture either, so thank you, uh, Bonnie, for this picture. All bred by the Lewises, all three of these. 
So again, here's the famous uh, pig roast at the Lewis house, and uh, Leonard's either listening to a joke or telling him a joke, and Passy's is getting with it there. Paul's, he's cutting it up. So uh, they they had the meeting there probably for close to 10 years at the Lewis's house. I probably went to five or six of them, and uh, they'd have the state futurity, and then I believe a meeting, and they'd, they'd take pictures and put it in the magazine. Usually Joan Schultz would write a little article about it, so... Uh, kind of a cool deal every year. Great get together. Talk about a down home get together. They'd put that pig in there and roast it, and then carve it. And I think it was a potluck after that, but uh, with the pig, and then everybody brought stuff. I recognize those barns and fences uh, from the Lewis's for years. It was a great place to show. Just a little outdoor arena, but and then you just trailered. It was a one day and an afternoon deal. And uh, the who's who of Minnesota was always there. Bud Campbell, uh, of course, Lewis's themselves, and uh, Arnie Marker, and a lot of other people. So it was always a great time. So again, here's Joan. And this is very fitting. Uh, Joan Schultz and Joan Lewis and several other people like Lee Rupplinger were very instrumental in uh, doing the POA giveaway. This was the second recipient of the Minnesota POA giveaway, and they do it at the state 4-h show i believe and this is uh, lisa flory she was actually from about 10 miles from where we lived and i ended up uh, knowing them pretty well they came over to the place several times but this is their mother roseanne and lisa and they won cv coat of fancy and that's joan and how fitting she's there making sure the transfer gets uh the transfer of ownership gets signed so Lewis's were very instrumental and stuff like that. Like I say, traveling around inspecting ponies and just welcoming people in the POAs and making sure people knew where the shows were and the meetings and how to get involved. So uh, this picture would have been in uh, 1984. So here's a picture from the 70s. When I put this on Facebook, some people said they didn't even notice there was a POA over there. It almost looks like a tree with a white heart on it or something. But now on the left, that's Bonnie Lewis with TA Big Creek Brave. And then that's uh, Alan in the middle on Miss Hydeck and Donald on the right with DM's Chino Shane. So all well-respected POAs. I think all three of those were supreme champions as well. So another cool thing about Lewis's is they not only liked showing halter, you know, they showed their kids horses in halter, and then he ended up showing his own babies in halter, but they were also big believers in cart, and here, of course, the sleigh, and uh, this was a Joan Schultz picture taken at the St. Paul Winter Carnival. A lot of Minnesota people promoted POAs year after year, Bud Campbell, Leonard Lewis, Paul Passy, Arnold Marker. There's more, too. I believe the Bowmans, probably. But uh, they would go to the St. Paul Winter Carnival. Of course, St. Paul's the capital of Minnesota, and they have this huge, the Vulcans, and it's a big thing. If you're from Minnesota, you know all about it. There's a big uh, parade and stuff like that. Well, they had a contest. I don't know if they're still doing it, but all breeds, different breeds, and they'd have a pony class. Well, this is Leonard that year, probably in 83 or 84, and he's actually driving Paul Passy's little mare, uh, Enflo's Red Wing. So, of course, Enflo's Red Wing is C.A.'s Amaretta's mother and a couple of the other famous C.A.'s uh, mother. And that's that little mare right there. She was a little brood mare, but she was also broke to cart because in sl a sleigh, a cutter, because that's what you do in Minnesota with your ponies back in the 70s and the 80s. So another cool story quick before I wrap this up. One of the reasons my dad and Leonard got to be pretty good friends was they knew each other a little bit when this accident happened, but in a, I think it was probably this this year here or the next year, we hauled Driftwood Siri Tomahawk down for Bud to drive in the St. Paul Winter Carnival because he was missing him. So we cleaned him up and hauled him there, and Bud hauled his uh, cutter, and he showed him there. Well, Leonard was there, and Arnie Marker was there, and Arnie got in a little accident with his pony. I think it was one he'd picked up, not one he bred. And it got messed up a little bit, and Arnie got hit in the head. And uh, they somebody got the pony out. I was only like 12 years old at the time, but somebody took the pony back to the trailer. But they had to still contend with the sleigh that was on the path. 
and it was a long path, and you can imagine it's in deep snow. Well, Leonard and my dad, Pat Rourke, each grabbed one of the deals, and they pulled that sleigh the whole length of the deal. And they didn't know each other very well then. They'd probably known each other for two years. But after that, I would say they knew each other pretty well because that was a, a contest, let me tell you. And they had to get that sleigh back up to the pickup and to the trailer. And, and they did it because Arnie was out of commission there. So, And uh, that's just one of those cool stories about friendships and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think that is C.A.'s Casey's dam as well. Uh, Tracy he she was bred to gold prints quite a bit and then uh, I'm getting a little mixed up of course because he had uh, Lammers Dandy Dickens and then he had Amflo's Red Wing was his two main mares and uh, but his earliest gold prince babies I'm talking about Paul Passy were out of this little mare so so I got this picture at the end I have this picture at the end I should say because uh, you know gold prince became a legend in the POA breed as a small Appaloosa, and then he became a registered POA when the change to 14 hands, they hard shipped him as a POA. And that's an interlude to the next episode's gonna be about hardships. Not only Appaloosas that were hard shipped into POAs, but also uh, grade POAs or grade ponies that qualify to be POAs. So uh, you like that little segue there? That's gonna be maybe not next week, but coming up it could be next week but that's going to be our next episode episode 40 of my poa podcast will be the hardship clause but the reason i got gold prints on here is because uh without leonard and joan lewis you know and the passies and of course the rogers did great things with him after they bought him but uh miss Hydeck and some of those foals and then of course tough plot it and what gene carr did with tough plot it but that became so much of his own program that you know gold prints didn't get as much credit for that because tough plot it became a legend almost at the same time as gold prince but uh that really really what the lewises did with him really helped put him over the top and make him one of the top uh sires at the time so i want to end the show with a great picture here uh aaron from iowa sent me this picture again you know she won the first lewis for charity and i think this was her graduation party that's jeremy of course jeremy went in the u.s army and he's still in the army he'll be in 20 years i believe in september i reached out to him on facebook every once in a while over the years he would reach out to me on facebook so i did to tell him about this episode and uh, of course this is his grandma and grandpa joan lewis and leonard lewis and this would have been taken probably well aaron could tell us but uh, in the early 2000s i'm guessing so just a cool picture so I want to thank everybody for saying it was a great episode. It's easy to do when you have a good material like uh, the Leonard Lewis family. So I want to thank everybody for watching. Hopefully you learned some stuff about the Lewises or enjoyed uh, some of the stories that you probably didn't hear before. And, of course, great pictures. Again, the next podcast, uh, my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond, episode 40, will be about the hardship. Now, I don't want to get real political about it or get in fights or anything. We're just going to talk about more of the positive side, uh, all the Appaloosas over the years that became POAs and then uh, the ones that are you know don't have a pedigree or they were lost along the way and they were hardshipped uh, and became registered POAs. So, all right, everybody, thank you for watching. We got out of here uh, before two hours, so that's good. Everybody go enjoy their Tuesday. Uh, thank you again for all the nice comments on Facebook this week. Sometimes I get a little down uh, doing all this research and working a lot. Of, I work a lot of hours in my profession. So I want to thank the Jacksons family for pr providing a great studio for me. I named the Studio J after the Jacksons family. I'm the only one currently using this really nice studio. I have great sound equipment over here. Watch, I can... I can make a horse whinny or I can make a horse neigh and I can do all kinds of stuff. So, uh, again, thanks everybody for watching. See you next time. Enjoy the song.